You're listening to Power Athlete Radio, a podcast dedicated to empowering your performance every damn day. Join former NFL pro and Power Athlete founder John Wellborn as he dissects the greatest minds in strength, conditioning, and more. Joining him is everyone's favorite coach and hair model, Chris, aka Tex McQuilkin, Power Athlete's Director of Performance. So whether your goal is to be the hammer, destroy mediocrity, or simply move the dirt, you've come to the right place. Now with the warm-up done, let the gains begin. Power Athlete Nation, welcome to another episode of Power Athlete Radio. Tex here, the Director of Performance, and I'm sitting with Coach Zach Zillner, the Director of Athletic Performance for Texas Women's Basketball, and coming soon, Masters of Movement Athlete. What's up, man? How are you? Great. I didn't fill the sleeves for the role of demoing biceps, so we had to tap you in. Sometimes you got to call in reinforcements. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So big buys and ex- uh, not ex- we did do explosive stuff, but then the other thing was killer calves. Never thought I'd be the calf guy, but <laughs> today I'm the calf guy. Well, compared to John, you're the calf guy. That's a burn. Yeah, let's Mark it. It's on the record. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, that'll come back to bite me, but it's worth it. It's fun. Well, dude, I wanted to bring you in specifically because we're going to focus on the long-term development in respect to plyometrics for athletes. We have our amateur or novice training program out there, Bedrock, and there's heavy emphasis on barbell, so it's a linear progression. And then we pair that linear progression so you don't just get big and slow and fa- uh, fatter. Yeah. You get bigger, stronger, faster when you respect our key unlocking athletic potential with the Bedrock program is sprinting. A piece of the program that I think a lot of coaches take for granted is the plyometric piece. So we do jump within there, but we're focusing today on that long term development through plyometrics and being explosive. And picture perfect dream scenario and then some reality application that you've experienced through your your years of coaching and receiving athletes at the the college level, because I'm sure you've received some awesome rock stars and then folks that have never been exposed to weightlifting at all or plyometrics or specific training, but they're still very gifted individuals athletically and there's room to grow. So awesome. Welcome. Welcome. We're leaning on your expertise and can you qualify yourself to our listeners out there? Cause you've got a long, awesome career as a collegiate strength coach and utilizing tools like force plates to really understand this, this key to athletic performance, which is plyometrics. Yeah. I think, uh, my background, um, definitely suits me as a basketball person. I did my undergrad at the university of Kansas. Um, for there, I was an intern under the basketball team for five years. While we were there, we won a few games, um, won a conference championship every time I was there and advanced pretty far um, in the NCAA. We made it to a Final Four, um, got the privilege to coach a handful of All-Americans, handful of draft picks, player of the year. Um, and then I got to work with uh, one of the best strength coaches around uh, basketball-wise, Coach Andrea Hootie. If you don't know who she is, wake up, look yeah. it up. Um so from there, I went and I was the director of uh, basketball strength conditioning at University of Southern Miss. From there, I had a similar role at Illinois, went back to Kansas, and then now this is my sixth season at uh, Texas. Yeah. Yeah, man. And we, Power Athlete, moved to Austin. You were in place, and kind enough to reach out and developed a little friendship here, man. So appreciate you. Uh, so let's, yeah, let's jump into it. That's a pun. The... So the starting from the ground up, imagine you have a freshman in high school and their first exposure to formal strength training, what paired with barbell, what does our, our plyometric training look like? How are we starting them off? I think the biggest thing for any new athlete um, or any of these old guys to plyometrics is I like to get them out of their shoes to start with and see how their foot and ankle moves. Um, so you're obviously going to land on your feet and take off on your feet. So if your feet are screwed up, Um, It's just going to create problems up the chain. Um, So what we'll do is our first thing is we'll get them out of their shoes. And then I like to have everyone do a body weight squat. And then from there, I really pay attention to the feet. If there's any pronation of the feet, um, any abduction of the ankles. And you can see this is my big trick when we have recruits in. I'll see them walk. And usually with basketball, there's a lot of ankle injuries. And you'll see Mm -hmm. one person with an ankle, you know, abducted 
to the side. And usually there's an ankle injury um, and there'll be some, you know, restriction on the posterior side of that ankle. And that restriction there is going to limit, you know, how much that ankle can move in space, how much it can absorb force, which is really what we care about. Um, so from there, we'll watch them do a bodyweight squat, five to 10 of them, nice and easy, and kind of observe what that foot's doing and also where that knee is tracking. So if that knee can't get over the mid line of the foot, um, we have an issue just because when you're landing, you need that shin angle to be able to move forward and back. Mm -hmm. um, and I look at both feet. So if you have both feet that are restricted, um, that's less of a concern to me um, just because it's probably you know, something they were born with and how they are. And we can just attack that normally with some exercises. But if it's one over another, we need to ask questions about injury history or what's happened to that ankle in the past and then really address that and from there. And how often are they honest with their injury history? Uh, it depends if they're recruits, probably not as much. Mm -hmm. um, but like, you know, usually when an athlete comes to us, um, we get the whole medical write-up and everything. Um, but usually it's pretty glaring to see if something happened. Um, yeah. And then from there we can go down, like, was it an ankle injury? Was it a fifth metatarsal injury? Um, any number of things, big toe, um, all those things will affect how you move in space. Yeah. So it started with an assessment and most coaches would default, especially the, at the high school level, their assessment is some form of performance, meaning the vertical jump. So mm -hmm. they're looking as that or the broad jump. They're looking at these as assessments and you're looking at a foundational movement pattern, just the squat barefoot. Yeah. Every action has an opposite and equal re reaction, whatever Newton's law that was. Um, and if you can't, I put think it's three, three. Perfect. If you can't produce force efficiently into the ground, it's either going to lead to an injury or you're just not going to be as efficient as you could be, um, jumping as high or running as fast as you could. Yeah. So if, if now following that squat, do we get into like a unilateral single leg, like a lunge? Yeah. So we'll go a lunge pattern, like a split squat. And usually it's the same thing will happen. And this one, we more care about how that knee's traveling in space. So this one, the squat, you can see, you know, how the knee moves, um, but you're at a better position um, for how that front knee moves over the midfoot. And you can kind of see if that foot's rocking in and out, pronating, supinating, also, I like to pay attention to the back foot. Mm -hmm. What's that big toe doing? So a lot of basketball players, if they're really good at stopping and starting, their big toe mobility is horrible just because it absorbs everything. And a stiff foot, I mean, you want something that's stiff if you're changing direction. So we'll look, and if they have pain or can't bend that back toe, I know that's another um, area we need to address as well. Yeah. And so from there, we squatted. We lunge, let's say they can do all that, and then we'll do something that's called a snap down. So we're basically training the eccentric load into the ground and how they, um, I guess, adjust their position to get into that position that we want them. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's a little harder to hide, you know, if your feet move in and out or where that knee goes. Yeah, um, so, so it's gotta be quick. It's versus be quick. like a steady load with the squat, it's like Correct, pop. so a lot of kids will pass the squat one. Um, if they don't, there's usually a an injury. Um, then the snap down, we teach them start on their tippy toes with their arms above their head to snap down into an athletic position. Mm -hmm. And then from there really focus on, okay, where did they end? Where are their feet at? Um, and then from there we'll go to a snap down to a single leg. So it's not like a coming out and do like a lunge. It's more of like, they're just dropping that foot right in front of them. Yeah. Um, and then from there, pretty much you can see if there's that, you know, medial drop of the foot, pronation of the ankle, um, and then from there, it's, you know, up to you, your call. If it looks pretty bad, we probably need to adjust it with more correctives. And it looks, you know, pretty tolerable. Like we could probably put our shoes on and get ready to jump. Mm -hmm. And then is it just bilateral jump or jumping? Is it for a target height or we're still focusing on the landing? So what we'll do is let's say we did all those. We have our assessment of the athlete. We're still going to keep their shoes off. Um, and then we're going to get into this, like, I guess, quarter squat athletic position. And then they're going to jump, land. So we're taking the counter movement out of it okay. just because that counter movement is just going to add a bunch of variation, how they sequence and how uh, they compensate. So your athletes are your, your best athletes are your greatest compensators. So they're going to find a way, you know, to get that rebound or that 36 inch vertical or whatever. So we're going to take that out of it. They're going to start from a pause position, mm -hmm. jump, land. Um, we're just going to repeat that. So we're just going to go for height. Um, once we do that, we're going to do like a quarter rotation and you can kind of see of how they land in space. So they're going to jump, turn, 
land from that pause position, jump, turn, land. Um, and then from there, we're going to progress it to more of a high jump and do a broad jump. So your okay. broad jumps are going to be your most stressful jumps just because you are going forward and the ground stays still. So the ground's coming under you. So you can get more sheer force at the knee. Um, so that one, you probably won't want to dose as much if they're not as good as at the, uh, you know, vertical right. jumps. Um, and then from there, so you did all those bilateral. And then as you guessed it, we're going to go unilateral. Um, but the difference is we're going to take off with two, land on one. Yeah, that's same, good. Same pattern. Um, and then obviously from that, we're going to go from a counter movement jump. Yeah. So same thing, jumping up, quarter turns broad jump and now we're going to put that counter movement into play yeah it all makes sense and then i suppose how would we how we would work this into our our bedrock program is just exposure uh gradually build up probably put some of these jumps into the warm-up but then when it comes to the more the more powerful explosive stuff um put that once we're we're locked and loaded with the barbell following that but yeah how, now say we're writing that program and I have, I have four years. This is perfect case scenario. Uh, am I still utilizing these as assessments? Is there a certain uh, movements that I'm leading to in terms of athletic development where these are the key assessments? Yeah, we keep them in our program from their freshman to a senior just because I don't think, I mean, getting better at the basics isn't going to hurt you. And I think just as exposure to practice and injuries happen, um, and just like with practice, like you're naturally going to get stiffer just because of the demands of practice. I mm mean, -hmm. um, how hard you're working. So it's up to us to every week we do this two or three times a week. And I can see like, oh, is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Um, is someone who didn't have ish an issue now having an issue? So it's a super easy test that you can do every single day. So we usually start off our warm ups barefooted. Yeah. And then as the plyos get more extensive, we'll put our shoes on and then we'll continue to do them. So, yeah, we, so we've used them as warm ups, and then I also like using them as like a cool down to help when you're fatigued, those intrinsic muscles of the foot know like, hey, it's at the end of the game, I'm tired, this is how we need to land. Mm -hmm. um, and it's low amplitude, so it's not like they're going to be super taxed, but it's just, you know, revisiting that skill over and over and over. Yeah. So not only your assessment, also establishing a baseline, and you can get a feel of how practices impacting your athletes because they got studies as well how the stress of real life is potentially affecting their movement because it will and then how i mean in the off season how your training program is affecting their movement uh i like to i like to utilize a dead bug for that and i know we brought you in for some dead bug movement and just paying attention to the calves so if we're in a dead bug position laying down on our back straight legs driving our heels towards the sky how well is their dorsiflexion? Is there an imbalance between right or left? I like to bring that in, especially if I spend enough time with an athlete, as you very well know, because you spend a hell of a lot more time than I do with high schoolers. But uh, yeah, how that dorsiflexion and those calves change over time, practice a week, tells me if you know we're we're logging too many miles per se, or you know we need to. Uh, hold back this individual today or I need to tell the sport coaches, Hey, look out for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So now into the, the, the progress over the four years, we got our assessment established as baseline and, uh, checking in, but now the, the progress, cause you have athletes of different skill levels for four years. You got a first year, you got a, a senior that's on the verge of being a potential professional athlete. Now, how do you monitor, measure the exposure that then adjusts your your dosing and your prescription within sets and reps? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, and I get we have access to this, and most people don't, but a, a force plate. Um, so from there, we can see how the athlete actually sequ uh, sequences their jumps. Um, if you don't have a force plate, um, honestly, the protocol with the squats and the lunges helps a lot. And the big thing we add over time is just more exposure, more dosing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll just kind of ramp up the volume with those athletes that can handle it. Um, and then if you're in a different bucket where you need more correctives, we're going to ramp up those correctives. So we stick with the same, you know, simple plyos done correctly over time. 
Um, and we don't get too much variation in it just because if you just hammer those, um, you're really not going to need, you get a plenty of variation on the court. Yeah. Um, so we're in a controlled environment here, so I'm going to keep it controlled and that way they can keep grooving that pattern of how we want them to land, how it should feel, um, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And to help us paint a picture for a division one athlete. So in high school, we break it up into different seasons. So typically our basketball players are playing a fall sport uh, and then they transition into the winter sport of basketball. So now you got essentially professional athletes. Are they practicing like year round and then come to the weight room or is it weight room specific? And we're locked in on specific hours that we have to, I guess, generally and physically prepare without practice. Yeah, so now um, with the NCAA rule change, you can pretty much practice all year round. Obviously, the time at which you practice can be different. So there's an eight-hour period where it's basically two hours a week, basketball, six hours with me. And then in season, it's 20 hours total. So if you want to use, you know, none with strength conditioning and all basketball, you can do that. If you want to go 50-50, what we do is uh, 20 to 40 minutes before practice. And this counts as our dynamic warm up, power mm-hmm. development, strength development, speed development, mobility, everything encompassed in one bucket. And we handle all that and then go straight to practice. So, actually, what we're doing in uh, the weight room potentiates practice. Yeah, I love that. And the, I mean, you get the opportunity for the pre fatigue and it, it works into their, their work capacity long term and their skill development. They are fatigued and can they execute necessary skills? like fourth quarter. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Now say I am high school level, what would be, and I don't have sport, but I still have to train plyometrics. Would you then recommend getting more creative or is it, Hey, just stick to the basics and trust the process. I honestly think stick to the basics and trust the process. Um, the process is not an Instagram training handle. No, I need (laughs) that to be my handle, (laughs) but I really do think it's, you know, master these simple things. And if you really have a great coaching eye, you can pick up on a bunch of different things that they can tweak. I have, you know, players that have been first round draft picks that are still doing the same pause, jump, broad jump over a hurdle. Like it's nothing too crazy. The stuff you see on Instagram of all this jumping, spinning, cartwheel, whatever, it looks great for the views, but I don't see the carryover directly to the court. And the mm-hmm. way that I know the stuff we're doing now carries over to the court is because I have the data from the force plate to, to prove it. Yes. And you attend practice, mm-hmm. which is key. And coaches may say, you know, I don't have the time or they may be training a different team at said practice time, just the demands of a high school strength coach. So now, I mean, you get to see them move and any limitations that appear uh, how, how's that communication process? Are you allowed to, to touch base with them during practice or is I, it morally yeah, uh, I can, more observed? Uh, I observe a lot and then I can talk to them during practice, mostly of like how they're feeling. And I go into practice knowing like her hamstrings bothering her, her, she's got knee issues, whatever. And I can look through and check in like, Hey, how's your knee doing? Okay. Like during the next water break, let's do this stretch or come find me after we'll address this issue. Um, and you can kind of see during practice, like they're only wanting to land on their left leg cause their right leg hurts. And that's a red flag to me of like, okay, well, yeah, I know it bothers you, but we can't keep doing that. Or if you're going to continue to do that, we need treatment a couple times a day and you need to do some stuff on my, and that's going to help with that area as well. So I think if you're not going to practice and I get there's, you know, constraints on things, you're missing out on a ton. Mm-hmm. Um, just cause there's going to be difference in language of like, what was a hard practice, which was an easy practice. And I think you can give the best, you know, objective feedback versus coach might say it's super easy. The athlete might say it's super hard. Uh Um, You're usually the non-biased person. And I always tell like young coaches, or if you're first working with a team, you see practice, go emulate practice yourself. And the next day check in of where you hurt or where you're tight or where you're sore. And that's going to answer a lot of questions on what your athletes need or don't need. Yeah. The, I'm, I'm fortunate my coaching career began as sport and strength coach. You know, I'm back to that role just with a high school. So lead the dynamic warm up daily and then get the opportunity for the strength and conditioning. Strength is manual resistance and then conditioning is hell getting creative. I call it punishment. Mm-hmm. So we have a healthy relationship with hard work versus punishment. 
as they uh, they may see it, but get to see and feel and communicate one on one with the guys what is bothering them uh, versus just assuming that this is easy or assuming oh that wasn't that hard. Um, get that that one on one, and then the the cool thing is providing some like dead bugs I mentioned or some movement solution rather than just assuming, Hey, I need to stretch this. No, let's incorporate it into a full movement pattern that can open it up because they're compensating. And that's why that's tight or sore. The, um, I had the opportunity a a few years ago to attend a practice with you and see how it was operates. It was awesome. My favorite part was the, uh, they're not walk-ons. They're the practice squad. Those guys are the best. Those guys are awesome. They love hooping. Yeah, and I think it was six dudes that just interact and you get a little rest time, but they were, yeah, they were, you know. Yeah, for those of you that have never been one of our practices, it is three hours nonstop. There's, you get water when you can, but it's always high pace, always on the move. And so that's how kind of our weight room has to be as well. So they're get asked to, you know, go all out for three hours and we have to take recovery that, you know, seriously on the back end. Yeah. In, in respect to the, the, the dosing, how, how important is it to, to monitor volume and intensity? So intensity would be your uh, explosivity is close to your one rep max best effort, your best jump. And then volume is, I guess, your capacity, high number of jumps. And how do you balance that? Is it, I mean, yeah, I'll just throw it out there. How do you balance that? I think starting off with like, I'd rather have more volume and less um, uh, intensity just because we're learning something. So Mm -hmm. like jump roping is great just to build that rigidity over and over. Like the hurdle hops we do, I try to post, you know, what we do in the off season. It's over like a, you know, five or six inch hurdle, nothing crazy, but we're hammering that over and over and over and good pattern. So while you're learning something, you're probably going to have to do more than two or three reps. Yeah. Um, So we're making that, you know, amplitude of jump small enough where they can repeat that over and over and not going to be too beat up the next day. Likewise, we'll see, like, we'll do workout on Monday and then I'll talk to them Tuesday, like, Hey, are you sore? How do you feel? And if they're, you know, tore up from that, I'm like, okay, maybe we need to, you know, take a few reps off or they're feeling good. I'm like, Hey, let's go a little bit more today. And so I think that communication with your athlete is huge. I would always rather probably underdo something than overdo something, especially being close to season like that. If you're in season, when in doubt, do do less. Um, volume is what's going to make people sore yeah. more than intensity. This episode of Power Athlete Radio is powered by Train Heroic, the most immersive strength training app experience on the market. We've built our online training business by partnering with Train Heroic and helping us deliver all of our world-class training programs like Jack Street, Field Strong, and Grindstone. To learn which Power Athlete training program best suits your goals, Head to powerathletehq.com slash training. And if you're a coach looking to build a business with the best tech and training, go to trainheroic.co forward slash powerathletehq. And now back to the show. So I know people think like, oh, heavy weight. Oh my gosh, I'm going to be so sore. But it's like you maybe did three total reps of that exercise. You're not going to be sore. But if you did three by 10, um, there's a higher chance that you're going to be sore from that activity. Yeah. Years ago, I was a a strength and conditioning coach for a private high school and had basketball. And I actually lost the basketball team in terms of the weight room, not like uh, emotionally lost them and they quit buy in the coach. I lost the coach and he he took over the weight room and they did nothing but bodybuilding because the uh, the emphasis was on heavy weight and less is more and movement matters. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately I, I was, I failed to communicate that. Um, but you do awesome in the weight room and that you girls are cleaning, they're jumping, they're trap bar doing explosive stuff. So explain the emphasis and that I guess, I suppose the need to, uh, exposure and dosing with a barbell in conjunction with the jumps and practice. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is you have to expose these athletes to these stressors in the off season. Uh, I don't think people train hard enough in the off season and they either do one of two things. They don't train hard enough and then they try to ramp it up in season or they train too hard. And then right when season comes, they drop off everything. So I say the difference between a blister and a callus is dose and exposure. Uh, So it's the same thing. 
Um, just one, you overdid it. And one, you know, it's perfectly programmed like yeah. that. Um, so I think balancing that and then educating your athlete on what they're supposed to be feeling. Like in the summer, like, you know, we're going to smash you. Like it's going to be what you think of as strength and conditioning. Um, you're going to be sore the next day. That's fine. Um, you're going to be tired. That's fine. Um, but in season, like, I don't want you to feel like that. So it's like, hey, the reason why we are going heavy on clean today, we're only doing three total reps is because I don't want you sore like you were in July. And then as long as you educate them on that and how they should feel the next day, I'm like, hey, were you sore? Like, no, I feel great. You're like, perfect. Yeah. Um, So I think it's just educating that athlete on the why behind everything, especially because a lot of these athletes, you know, weightlifting isn't their favorite thing to do every day like you or I. Um, So it's like, well, how do I convince them that a heavy trap bar deadlift is going to help them play basketball and like well the weights are going to make them lose their jump shot exactly and so a part of it's like educating the athlete and then you got to educate these coaches because you know strength and conditioning for basketball is relatively new Mm -hmm. Um, and if you've had a coach that's been doing this a long time they may think like oh lifting especially before practice is going to hurt your jump shot and if you educate the kids or the athlete on hey, this isn't going to help your jump shot. Not shooting after practice and not shooting in the morning is going to hurt your jump (laughs) shot more than, you know, this three by five bench press we're doing. Yeah. And Um, uh, you mentioned earlier the key key term you threw out there is the weightlifting before practice potentiates. mm -hmm. And uh, I want you to essentially for any high school coaches out there, explain that purpose of I am, yes, weightlifting before we go into practice. And here's why. What is potentiation? Potentiation is basically the whole idea of like when you think something's heavier than it is. So like think of like if I picked up this coffee mug and I thought it was full of coffee and it wasn't, I'd rip it off the table. Um, So the whole idea is I'm lifting something heavy and then I lift something light. And the thing that I lift light is going to move at a quicker rate than it would if I just lifted it by itself. Um, So the whole idea is practice. So like I lift before practice, let's say heavy hand clean. Uh Uh-huh. And then we finish, go to practice, jumping through layup lines. Right now, I don't have, you know, a bar in my hands or catching it in that front rack position. I just have my body weight. Um, So basically, you're doing a whole contrast method, but before practice and then practice. Yes. And an opportunity to to recruit more. More muscle fibers. Through general. And what we're not saying here is shooting weighted basketballs. No. We're throwing weighted pitches and, and doing all that specific skill work. So it's general, like a clean, and throwing some weight around that then we're, we're tuned up, mm-hmm. we're potentiated. And the whole idea before practice, so I would challenge everyone, your next workout that you do yourself, right, take a, start your stopwatch, and then during that point in the workout where you feel the best, stop your stopwatch. And I guarantee you it's between 20 and 30 minutes, and that's when they leave. So we want them leaving right when they feel the best during the workout to go to practice. And we don't want them, you know, in that last basically 20 minutes of your hour workout, you're like, oh, God, we got four sets. I thought it was three. Damn. Yeah. You know, like we're we're having them feel fresh and going right to the court. Yeah. And uh, another key term you threw around earlier was correction. So we have exposure and, and dosing paired together, but then there is this big key, which is correction. And I attended one of your strength sessions, and this is where... You know, this athlete goes off and does this specific thing, and then this individual does that. So is this this opportunity to now get, give specific for then, whether it's connected to plyometrics or performance? So explain that aspect of what you're looking for, and then how do you decide said correction uh, based off plyos? So let's say that athlete comes in, they do their squat, their ankles going out, they do their lunge, same thing. So We'll have everyone kind of like an ankle foot circuit before we start, especially if we're doing plyo. So we'll have something to mobilize the or yeah, mobilize the joint, stabilize the joint, strengthen the joint, and then we'll perform. And so where you are on the mobility, stability, and strength part is depending on how far progressed or regressed you are. Um, so if you're a newbie, it might be more of like a body weight type situation for your strength. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who's further down the line, it's more of, you know, we have weight, um, something more dynamic. Um, And so we'll do that joint by joint. So we'll do that for we're doing a squat that day. That might be more of a hip dominant day where it's mobilize, stabilize, strengthen, and then we perform. And so if we're doing a plyo, the whole thing would be like an example would be mobility would be like an ankle rocker 
mm-hmm. um, or a standing calf stretch. A stability might be, you know, standing on a slack block, single leg RDL, anything one footed. And then a strengthening would be like a calf raise, donkey calf raise. Um, Make sure you got a good body for those. Yeah, tib raise, anything like that. And then performance would be, you know, vertical jumps, horizontal jumps, single leg jumps, whatever we're doing for that day. Um, And then we keep that theme throughout the week when we lift before practice. So if my main movement is the hand clean, for instance, what things do I need to be really good at cleaning? So I need good ankle mobility, probably good adductor mobility, good Mm -hmm. T-spine, good front rack position. So in my warm up, I need to make sure I'm hitting all those areas to really get out of the clean what I want to get out of it. Yeah, that's awesome. And then dialing it in. So great crash course on a specific warm up versus a general get your chili hot, break Mm -hmm. a little sweat, get your heart rate up, warm up, and how we can break down macro movements into specific pieces. And I do like the mobility, stability, and strength. And shit, man, you're coaching, you're seeing how they're moving. Like athletes will lie to you about injuries or what's going on, but movement never will. No. And, and working that into the specific correction. Uh, awesome. So it, coaches do need to involve themselves. It's not just a magic program. You have this opportunity to make any adjustments necessary for their performance. That's, that's another thing. A lot of coaches are, are locked in. This is what my card says. I have to do it. Can't be married to the card. Can't be married to the card. So I guess take, take us back momentarily of when did you learn that lesson and had this freedom and opportunity? Was it Hootie that allowed you to it or you know, some place where you were the, the head coach, the head, head honcho? I think the big thing is like in school, it, I mean, they have to teach you, you know, three weeks deload, whatever, all these linear periodization. I remember going to class, I'd learn this. And then I go in the weight room, Ooh. it was very nonlinear. And I mm-hmm. was like, hmm, like, how does this even work? And then at the same time, I was working with track, which is very linear. So I'm like, okay, these people are getting bigger, stronger, faster doing linear. These people are doing bigger, faster, stronger, nonlinear. Like, what's the difference? What's the disconnect? And I looked and track, you know, when your meet is, it's every, you know, third Saturday or whatever, you know, when regionals are, you know, when you know, whatever. Yeah, And then basketball, it's like this week, the game's Monday, Wednesday. This week, it's Monday, Thursday, Sunday. It's all over the place. So it's like, well, if it's like that, I can't have it structured like strength day, power day, speed day, whatever. Um, and so, you know, I'm asking Hootie, like, how do you program for it? It's like, well, nonlinear. This is what we do three days out. This is what we do two days out. This is what we do one day out. This is what we do day after. And you can mix and match of what the emphasis is for that day. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think the biggest thing that helped me was becoming an older lifter <laughs> of like before when you'd like in your twenties, your squat warm up was bar 135, 225, 315, do, you know, as many reps as you can and you're good to go. And now if I did that, I wouldn't be able to walk for a month. And so that kind of got me into thinking of like, okay, I need a back squat today. What are the honestly now 10 things I need to do in order for me to have a successful back squat session. And then I was like, okay, if I feel beat up like this, what does somebody's body feel like that has a three hour practice yeah. and a hard three hour practice change of direction? I'd argue that basketball is the most violent sport on your body. Um, just for the change of direction, the jumping, you're landing on the floor. Like it's not, you know, a contact sport like football, but like they're running into each other and stuff. Like it's, it's pretty gnarly on your, foot, ankle, knee, all that kind of stuff. So I'm like, well, Mm -hmm. they feel like they got hit by a truck. We probably just can't have your generic, you know, karaoke, skip, whatever, warm up. And so we need to really dial it in for each player. And then a step further from looking at those force plates, we learn like, okay, these two athletes both have 30 inch verticals, but how they get there is totally different. Yeah. One guy's more of a reactive jumper, knee dominant. One guy's more of a timing hip jumper. It's like, okay, well, what do they need? What are they good at? What are they bad at? The reactive guy is really fast. The hip guy is slow. And so it's like, well, in order to keep the fast guy healthy, I probably need to make him slower. And the uh, for the hip dominant slow guy, for in order for him to play more, I need to make him faster. Yeah. So they need different things. Um, and so from there basically we curate their cards for the day um, to be exactly the dose of medicine that they need. Yeah. And their personality and what the hell's going on in their life. That dictates it as well. Got to make them pop. Yeah. Uh, And that doesn't include just motherfucking them 
and now every I think day. the biggest thing with these athletes now is the exposure every single day with them is you can pick up on like your consistent people that are consistent no matter what. We had a uh, player at Kansas. He was uh, player of the year and he was Mr. Consistent all the time. It's a terrible nickname, but yeah, but you get it. win the lottery. How you doing? I'm, I'm good. You know, your cat died. How you doing? I'm good. Like always that. And then we had another player who would have every day was, it was the best day ever, worst day ever, whatever. And then you could see they couldn't produce force, you know, as consistently and their development was hindered from it. Um, so from there, we try to make the most consistent players we can. And then if you do have, you know, if you are one of those up and down people, it's like, well, what areas can we help you in so you can be more consistent? Is it behavioral health? Is it nutrition? Is it me showing you how to plan out your day? Um, little things like that. Yeah. And then that constant communication, you know, builds a trust with both of us that I can be like, hey, how are you feeling today? And I know they're going to give me a right answer of, hey, I feel good. Let's push it today. Or, you know, honestly, I'm run down, didn't get a lot of sleep. Like, can we do something else besides what you have planned here? And some days I might be like, yeah, we can do something different. Or other days I'm like, you know what? It's June. You can tough it out. Let's let's get through it. Let's work on some grit. <laughs> yeah, for um, real. So yeah, it's that constant communication back and forth that I think makes what we do work. Yeah. One of the most challenging communication challenges. That's a poor that's representation really there. <laughs> that I've had was uh, coaches' sons. They know how to, they, they know how to play the game. Yeah. They know to tell me what I want to hear. And then, you know, their, their body is telling me and showing me something else. So now I guess playing a different game with them versus the standard, uh, the check-in with the coach. I think that's been a, a fun challenge. Uh, just, you know, now getting to learn the kid and then what's going on outside of their world that then effectively helps me communicate because, uh, I know you get a little bit more time to spend with your athletes than the average coach, but like what minimal time you do have, can it be effective communication, not just the standard? Yeah, I feel good. Yeah, I think like we'll check in and then throughout the whole workout, like I'm constantly walking over like, what'd you have for lunch? Like, how was your test the other day? Like, how's, you know, how was your meeting with coach? Did you watch film this week? Like all these other things you can check in during that 30 minute window that we have. And then all of a sudden the, yeah, I'm good, whatever turns into, I didn't eat lunch and I bombed the test and I'm worried about practice. And then you're like, okay, well, let's see what things we can solve, you know, in this 30 minutes before practice. Um, or I'm having the worst day ever and, you know, you get moving around feeling good and suddenly the day's not that bad. Um, no. So it's that constant check-in throughout the whole thing. And our uh, athletes mess with me. They'll do the same thing to me. They're like, do you eat lunch today? How's your coffee today? Blah, blah, blah. That's, and it's like, perfect. I like that it. Candor. We're holding each other uh, you know, accountable. Yeah. Once you get to that level, I think it's a, it's a good sign Absolutely. versus just, uh, just waiting to be told or yeah, I'm good. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can give it back a little bit. The uh, fun give and take I have with my athletes is currently centered around the liver king and how mm. unprimal I am. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay, guys, <laughs> you mean not on the uh, additives? Yeah, you're right. For sure. I am not primal. Vitamin S. <laughs> yeah. And the what's interesting is uh, what we're going to get into now is, is where athletes make mistakes. Athletes will lie to you. Movement uh, tells you something else. And a lot of coaches or athletic trainers or people involved with the athlete tend to freak out or over-exaggerate or over-dramatize something that movement is saying. So now what are some some key things that you've observed over the years, whether it's a movement or an attitude or something where coaches just freak out and focus on the wrong thing that then could, could potentially exacerbate the issue instead of just something I can fix with a simple check-in or movement corrective exercise so what are some things that people blow out of proportion and focus on the wrong thing that negatively affects performance? I think a lot of the time it's like we forget, once again, our best athletes are our greatest compensators. So if you have an athlete that like they look all out of whack and whatever, like you don't need to take them out of practice. They can practice. They've been doing all this stuff, but we need to do stuff on our end to get them feeling better. And I think one of the biggest things is like you look at Twitter and you Buddy that puts the jumping video out, if that knee comes a little valgus, people are like, oh my God, their knee's going to shoot through the ground, like blah, 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 And it's like, no jumping. Yeah, Shut them down. Yeah, you, they need to, you know, three weeks of no jumping and these corrective. It's like, no, they'll be, let's look at 
where is that valgus coming from? If you look at the best jumpers in the NBA, if they stop right before they take off, they're valgus. Because mm-hmm. that allows you to lo- use your glutes and spring through that roof. Um, but really what we need to look at is what's that navicular, what's that foot doing? And now if you're always shooting valgus and your foot's dropping in, sure, we need to work on some things. Yeah. Um, and then with that, we need to make sure a lot of other things are dialed in as well. Nutrition, um, your mental space, because stress is stress. Your body's not going to differentiate between whether you bombed the test, your boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with you, you didn't sleep the night before. Like it just knows that you're stressed out. So we need to kind of help out with these other things. And then they might have to do twice the work with correctives and working with me and our athletic training staff. Yeah. There is a book out there. I think I don't have my computer in front of me. It's called zebras. Don't get ulcers. Yeah. Something along those lines. Mm -hmm. If you search zebra and ulcers, the book will come up, but explains in a, you know, a coach and athlete perspective, the impact of stress from the outside world onto our movement and performance. Uh, I mean, what are, what are some other things? I mean, injury is a big one. And the, the valgus, especially what always blew my mind, was a uh, coaching a jump shot. There's some internal rotation going on in my, my, uh, my loading phase, my going down in the jump shot. But then that could be viewed, if I don't have a ball in my hand, as some valgus knee, some, some collapse going in there. So what are some other things in terms in respect to performance that people may not, uh, that are freaking out and getting wrong a little bit? I think the whole like knee health situation, I think it starts with like your ability to create stiffness. So if you can't have a stable foot and be able to have your hip stable, like all those, that force is going to go to the knee. And of course you're going to get hurt. Um, you know, people always ask like, what can I do to help prevent against ACL stuff? And I always say, improve your body comp. So if you have a high center yeah. of mass, that's not useful mass. Um, or even if it is useful, if your low, if your lower half isn't strong enough, you're going to have issues. Yeah. So I think our planking progressions and loaded carries and overall just lifting barbells and dumbbells is going to help, you know, with ACL, uh, it's not prevention, but reduction. Injury of risk reduction. Yes. Um, those can all help. So I think people don't spend enough time with all those planking variations and want to do all these flexion extension stuff, but like hammer that basic front plank, lateral plank. Copenhagen, I think is a huge one that people aren't doing. What's Copenhagen? So Copenhagen. Like a Captain Morgan? Uh, basically, you're going to be like a side plank and your top leg is going to be on a bench. Okay. Um, and it's basically Straight, uh, bent? Bent if you're new, straight if you're advanced like us. Um, and then it's going to help that adductor strength. And I think when you know, you're moving in space, your adductor slows down your leg if you're going lateral, especially in basketball. And a lot of people with lower back issues I've found have weak adductors. And yeah. just because you think, oh, I'm hitting them with the lunges or squats, it's like, no, you're not. Um, so I think Copenhagen is something that I've added in the last couple of years, I think has made a big difference. Nice. Yeah, we, we utilize that often in our training programs, um, just different name. Mm-hmm. So we, we do Captain Morgan, like I'm, I'm marching if we're watching on the YouTube. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The captain with his knee up and toe up there, um, but then go into a side pillar and we're able to march and exchange. So I get both the AB duction if my bottom leg is straight and supported and the AD duction if my top leg is. And we're able to uh, essentially utilize it from prevent any injury risk reduction from a side contact hit. I can still maintain my good sprinting and acceleration position and get that foot back to the ground. Um, I like if we're in a partner scenario or out in the field, hold the top leg. Yeah. I just think a little buddy system. Yeah. Great movement that people aren't doing enough of and make sure you do it as part of your warm up. I see too many people put the planking and all that kind of stuff in the end. Oh, we're Um, on the same page. I think it's just a great primer or whatever of getting ready to lift. So if you want to lift heavy weight, you need to practice on creating stiffness and you need to practice that in your warm up. If you're leaving that to the end, you're just going to be fatigued. And honestly, like we said, the last 20 minutes of your workout, you just want to be done with it anyways. You're probably not going to, you know, attack it with the same, you know, fury as you would at the beginning of your lift. Yes. Now this leads me to a cool one. I want to get your take on is pregame warm up. So we talked about the use of the barbell and the potentiation and to bring that into practice, 
But now what's your focus and attention when it comes to preparing us for peak level performance? I think the biggest thing is just getting their mind into like the game, like we play, like I don't care if it's the worst team in the league or the best team, like you're playing against yourself. And I know that's so cliche, but that's what you have to, you're playing against the game. Um, and then I'm kind of different with a lot of people with this. I think everybody gets ready for games differently. So me personally, I've played with people that they need to go out there and take, you know, 500 shots before they, we start our warm up. And I've worked with people that are like, Hey dude, wake up. We, we got to go out there and both played equally as well. Um, mm -hmm. obviously I think there's probably a middle ground to all that. Um, we found with catapult that we had a team once that they were so hyped in the pregame warm up and everything that they had more than half their load before the game even started. Um, so it's kind of teaching these athletes of, Hey, these are the things ideally you should get up, try to get up X amount of shots before the game, no more than that. Um, and then standing is a load. So you need to be off your feet. Um, so we kind of give everyone what we usually do is a couple weeks before our first game is we do a simulation of warm up. Hmm. So what do you need to do? And we track them and then we'll see like, okay, you had this amount of load. You had th that amount of load. How did you feel? And then we'll kind of overlay it with their game data. So we'll see like, Hey, let's say in a game you had, you know, a thousand workload and then the pregame you were at 500 and it's like, well, that's probably a little too much. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from there we'll kind of see of like, Hey, during your warm up, what did you feel like you want to do more of less of? And then we just do a traditional dynamic warm up, band stretch. The only reason why we do the static band stretching is because it's so ingrained in sport culture and it kind of gives them a chance to chill out, stretch wherever they need to, and then be ready to go. So I think, yeah, the game, all the stuff we've done leading up to it is what's going to make the difference in the game. Not if we did, you know, this calf protocol before tip off or this right. hip exercise before protocol. We'll have some athletes where I'll know that they need to create stiffness before the game. And I'll be like, hey, while they're stretching, you do a couple side planks, you do a Copenhagen. Yeah. Um, your right ankle bothers you. Let's work on that right ankle mobility before the game. Um, but other than that, it's like they know what they need. Yeah. Um, and if you watch before tip off every game, there's some people that jump up and down right before. There's some people that stretch. So your body inherently knows like, okay, I need mobility. Oh, I need stiffness. Mm -hmm. um, so let your body do what it wants to do. Yeah. Now for, for a high school athlete, less in tune, mm -hmm. how would you guide it? Would you utilize the, the pregame warm up as an opportunity to still focus on your mental preparation, but hey, team, we're going to do this together? Like what would be the focus now for a high school athlete? Yeah, I would do it together and uh, kind of condense your pregame warm up and all the stuff they're really good at. Don't have to think a lot. So there shouldn't be a lot of detail. It shouldn't be like, all right, we're going to do a figure four and a lunge rotation back and do a calf stretch or whatever. Um, I think it should be, you wouldn't believe the warm ups that I've seen. Um, but I try to make it as simple as possible with as few directions as possible. So it's like, okay, I know I need to get a hamstring stretch. This is what I'm going to do because I'm probably more worried about, you know, what we're doing in 30 minutes than where I, my, you know, hip should be in relationship with my trunk for this exercise or whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just kind of dumb down a dynamic warm up, And then from there I'll grab each athlete and be like, Hey, you should probably hit that. You should probably hit that. Remember the other day in our warm up, you did this plank variation, do 10 reps of that. Um, and then from there, it's like, what do you need from me? Do you yeah. need this stretch? Do you need me to leave you alone? Like, what's up? Yeah. The Imagine we have an hour. I don't know how basketball operates. It's usually an hour before tip. Okay. So um, lacrosse is, yeah, we got an hour and uh, we gear up and we do 10 minutes of the essential lead a dynamic warm up that's different. So that way I can still get their ears and communicating versus accommodating to the same damn warm up every single time. Uh, just to get work on their communication, but it's never anything they've never done before. Correct. Um, and hitting all planes of motion and primal movements, foundational, and then the uh, just getting some explosivity off the ground. Because I know in 10 minutes, then I have 50 minutes of, you know, skill work where basketball would be layups, lacrosse, just some catch and throw, and then factor into more of a, like game simulation or plays or just like four on threes, which is a dumbed down version of six on six. So it's also 50 minutes of quote unquote training that then lead to a game. 
So then, um, you know, I'm not trying to take too much away in that 10 no, minutes. And they're going to, in that hour, they're going to go to the locker room, sit down. So I think. Oh, you fancy in indoor sport. We're, we're big time. So I think another strategy, you know, pregame is their nutrition and hydration. So they just essentially worked out for an hour before, mm -hmm. you know, the biggest moment of their day. And let's make sure, you know, they at least grabbed a bar, a piece of fruit, fruit snacks, I don't care, and hydrate. Um, just because a lot of times before games, you forget everything because you're so focused on the game. You forget to have a glass of water or, you know, you just burned, you know, an hour's worth of energy and we need to replace that for, for tip. Yeah. The uh, next, this is, I'm just curious about this one, your role in recruiting. Mm -hmm. So football, we well versed on this podcast and the role of a strength coach for recruiting. Basically, you do a bunch of freaking bicep curls. You put on some tight spandex and you look the part in the weight room now a little bit different in your role. So in this recruiting process and what I'm most curious about, what are you allowed to assess? Yeah. Our biggest thing is like, um, I like to find out if you want to go to the next level or not. So are you someone that's just here to get your degree and be the best college athlete you can? Or are you someone here who's here to do that and go to the next level? And then from there, you know, I'm lucky to have had the experience to work with those athletes to see what it takes to actually play at that next level. Mm -hmm. um, so from there, I always tell them, like, I have the blueprint to get you where you want to go. I just need you to invest that time and to do it. And if I'm upfront about them of, like, how we do stuff, like, we practice hard, we practice long, the intensity is high, um, there's a lot of demand. So if you aren't someone who's willing to put in, you know, two to three to five hours a day of work, a lot of it on your own, um, or with me outside of that, those times, um, then this probably isn't a great place for you. And I'd rather them know that up front instead of coming here for a year and be like, wow, this is a lot. Like, I don't know if I can handle this. I need to go somewhere else. So yeah. I get it. Not everyone's, there's a lot of the appeal now, I think, is we only practice for an hour and a half and it's like the pro style way of doing things. And it's like, I think that sounds great, but the difference between you and a pro is reps and you can't get reps with an hour and a half practice. Sorry, right. like you, you can't. So they, I, I appreciate that. You're being honest yeah. with them about how hard and difficult this is and, and asking, it's selfishly, do you want to be? Like, I don't want an athlete to come here that's not about working. And it just makes my job a lot harder and it kind of ruins with our team culture of, hey, this is what we do. We show up every day, we work. Outside of our allotted time, we also work, we get an extra and it's just, part of the whole process of getting better. It's all about reps. There's no substitution for reps. Yeah. And I mean, the, the Europa dope of, Hey man, you're going to be here. You're going to be a rock star. You're yeah. going to start. It's, it's all about you. We're going to build our offense. I think if you sell that and then the athlete doesn't pan out to that, of course they're upset. Cause In like, one you year. promised me something. Yeah. And it's like, I'm like, Hey, it's your fault if you don't succeed here. And it's your fault if you do, like we give you every resource you can, you just need to show up and be willing to, you know, practice every day with intent, not mm -hmm. just go through the motion. You need to be very intentional in everything you do. Um, so from there, I'm brutally honest with them. And then I show them, you know, the sports tech and how we can help you. Um, so I can just, so are you allowed to have them jump like and utilize the force plates? Um, have them jump, but I can show them scans of people that we've changed. Okay. And then I can show them like, this is your favorite WNBA player. This is how she jumps. Um, this is an athlete that I worked with here. And this is how we changed her into Over. the number one draft pick. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and then we can show you, you know, in real time, like I can make you a better athlete. I tell them I don't care about your squat max, your bench max, your clean max. No one, when you become an All-American is going to ask you how much do you back squat. If they did and that mattered, I'd be getting paid a whole heck of a lot more. Yeah, we'd be focused on something else. Now, I know you can't physically assess them in terms of their jump and performance, but now I guess for this is a message to all those younger athletes out there. How, what are you looking at? Body language, how they're communicating to you, what goes into that? I think the biggest thing is you need to treat this like a job interview. Like we're interviewing you as much as you're interviewing us. And I think you need to come with, you know, come with questions like all these Schools are going to wow you with their new shiny equipment and facilities and everything. And that's all great. But like you need to ask these questions of like practice demands. What's expected of me when I come here? Like what things am I expected to do? What's the time commitment like? Um, 
I always tell them, ask the players. Like, they'll give you a straight-up answer. Do you like coming to lift weights? Do you think there's value in it? Mm -hmm. Do you think you're getting better at practice? Like, is it worth the time commitment? And, like, don't just show up and wait for your photo shoot and have a good time. Be like, well, these this place gave me the most shoes or this place is going to this foreign tour. Like, you're going to be there for four years, hopefully, and it needs to be a good fit for you. And how are you going to get better? How are you going to use this university to get you to the next level? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. The uh, I had the fortunate opportunity to go on the recruiting trail as a coach and look for different things at high school to get ready for the next level. And some things stuck out clear as day. In lacrosse, we have equipment bags, so put all our gear into a bag. If your mom is carrying your bag it's after the practice, the game, whatever it is, I'm sorry, man. You're not our guy. So different little things like that go a long way in terms of you know, just earning the respect of the coach to say, okay, if I pour into this athlete, are they going to give everything they can to increase the, their, uh, who they are as a person in the long run? Um, very interesting. Okay. So covered games, covered, uh, long-term athletic development. Now, I mean, you're getting into the online training game yourself Mm. as you've modeled on power athletes, masters of movement. Uh, explain that process now. It's just some digital coaching versus, hey, the in-person adjustments that you have the opportunity to make. Yeah, so, um, you know, Andrea Hootie and I got presented with this opportunity to create a basketball-specific online program. On Train Heroic. On Train Heroic. Plug Train Heroic. Um, Josh from Train Heroic's been awesome. Um, the online space is something really cool because we have a ability to impact people all over the world, not just... You know, the 14 athletes I work with here and the 14 she works with at UConn, um, we're able to reach the masses. We can show exercise videos, prescriptions, details. You can message me within the app, which is cool. Um, And it's just totally different because you're programming for a vast variety of people compared to the people I see right in front of me. Yeah. Um, So there it's more detail oriented with videos, descriptions, all that stuff. It's also great for... The amount of emails I get every day of, hey, coach, can you send me a program? My thing is like, okay, I'll send you the link to my program. And if you're not invested enough that you want to spend, you know, the $19, which is crazy cheap to buy that for the month, then I'm probably not going to, you know, give my time to be on an hour long phone call with you. And I know that sounds harsh or whatever, but if I'm investing into you, I'd prefer that you invested in me as well. Yeah. And dude, from fitness perspective and coaching that question gets asked a lot and often it's like us going to a uh you know our buddies that are in the finances game and hey just tell me what freaking stocks yeah. to buy and they know we don't respect them they don't respect our our careers so this is a, essentially an opportunity for somebody to put skin in the game for as often as they uh, ask for free guidance at, and yeah, it, and it my, is a very cost effective my thing is it's range. you know 19 bucks a month to have access um, you can message anytime and I nerd out over this stuff all the time. So I'll answer as many questions as you want. And then it's, you know, what's comprised over, over 10 years of what I've been doing and over 30 years of what Hootie's been doing. And I mean, once again, look at her resume, um, to have that kind of access for 19 bucks is honestly ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we have that, the hooping with Hootie. And then I put out one called the Z train and it's basically what I do three days a week training. I'll throw in some of the cardio stuff I like doing, but I just log it. I'm, you know, a month ahead of everybody. Um, so basically you're doing exactly what I'm doing. So it's kind of a fun, uh, message board we have in there of, you know, people cussing me out of certain things I put in there and it's, it's, it's good fun. fun. So we have a mix of men and women that are all in it about 40 people right now. Um, and that's just been kind of fun just to see people, um, train a different way than probably what they're used to going to fitness classes or a personal trainer. You're kind of training like, you know, washed up athlete like I am, which is, which is fun. Oh yeah, we, we get it. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the cool thing is you're going through the training yourself and then know what these people will feel and experience. And then anything we put in out there on train heroic as well of any of our training programs, like John, well, it's super easy. It's yeah, right John, on their phone. Yeah. John and I have um, tested it. We've been through the ringer yeah. and essentially know where you will fail. And this, this helps us write our specific training warmups because we can anticipate where they're going to lead to potentiation, as we talked about in the podcast, and also where movement breakdown. 
and then aim to put it into the warm up to then prime it for the heavy ass weights that are involved. I, in I think that's the big advantage of this program is like we have two blocks for the warm ups for the Z train program and. Usually most people, when they lift, they have like upper body day and your upper body day is no, like, no. all right, let's do some push ups, couple arm swings and let's go. And then they wonder why, like, oh, I'm so beat up, like lifting hurts you. And it's like, no, lifting doesn't you hurt, hurt you. yourself. You, you doing it incorrectly hurts yourself. So it's, they're doing these correctives that, you know, we give to our professional athletes, D1 athletes that they're getting, you know, on their phone at their local Gold's Gym or garage or wherever they lifting out at. Um, so no, yeah. it's, it's pretty cool. State line. State line, ATX. plug, state line, plug, uh, lift ATX. Yeah, yeah. The uh, yeah, man. It's it's a cool experience, and it's certainly going to help you grow as a coach because now you're working on how do I communicate this because I don't have this line of communication where they're right in front of me. I can use my hands with the the in person. Now I can't. So how do I articulate and communicate so they can uh, bring that into their movement? The challenge with coaching in person. Feedback's immediate. Now it's distant. The squat will come up at some point, whether it's later in the week or later in the cycle or, you know, later on when they get back to that movement pattern within their own training because life gets in the right. way. Now, how do we let, leave a lasting, memorable, impactive direction that they know to apply it? Um, so we, John and I are all over the feeds for uh, aiming to correct. We encourage video as much as we can just to then line up an assessment and then how I find the most effective way to coach is through the setup. Adjusting the setup mm -hmm. corrects a lot of execution problems. And that's the cool thing about Train Heroic is man, You're we right we have the opportunity to theoretically it's fun. be it's right like there. A, a challenge, especially me, like I'm so like I'm just used to just telling people stuff. And my sister, shout out to Chelsea, has helped me a ton with the language and how to write things just because I'm not a writer. I'm, I'm a not with that attitude. Well, I'm working on it. Um, but she'll read it and go through it and be like, yeah, I understand that. Or what the heck are you even talking about here? And I'll be like, well, blah, blah, blah. she's like, no, rewrite it like this. It makes sense. I'm like, okay, cool. So it helps with that. And then it honestly helps me articulate it better to my athletes because I use better language. Yes. Yeah. Just do it. It's fun. Yeah. Uh, lightweight, baby. All right, a lot here. the The biggest thing, man, is is these uh, the the progression of ply ups, uh, plyos, excuse me, exposure and dosing. Uh, that's awesome, and I love the the ground up. And coaches are very tempted to get in, get too creative. Unfortunately, especially when it works uh, working with younger athletes, master the mundane. We went through the basics: uh, squat, uh, lunge, and then some single leg. Uh, explosivity, but the assessment established the baseline throughout. Good to go. Cool. Uh, if people want to learn more and follow you, they can find you on Masters of Movement. And what are some set tags that you got? Masters of Movement for sure. And then uh, Instagram and Twitter are the same. It's Z S, and then my last name Z I L L N E R. Um, if you have questions, usually DMing me on Instagram or Twitter works the best. Um, possibly might start doing a YouTube uh, where we kind of explain the workouts, more of a voiceover on you know thought process between the workouts and what everything goes involved. Um, and my bio for both the Twitter and the Instagram, you can find the Hoopin' with Hootie and the Z Train. If either one of those appeals to you, we'd love it. Seven day free trial. So log in for a week, copy and paste a week. You're good to go. Yeah, and follow the the team. We got Follow the team, Texas women's basketball. If any oh, yeah. of you guys are in Austin and want to come watch a lift or lift with me or come to a game, holler at me. I truly uh, mean o o uh, open door policy. So if you're ever in the area, if we're playing in your, your hood, let me know. Yeah. And a beautiful new facility we have yet to check out at this moment in time, but aim to. Coming soon. Yes. All right. Well, there you have it. Another episode of Power Athlete Radio. Bye. Bye.